Francisco Mann, stage name Lola Horowitz, was born in 1917. She was a dancer and began her career in Warsaw before the war. She was considered among the best dancers of her generation in Poland. Francesca took fourth place in the international dance competition held in Brussels. The people of Poland considered her one of the most beautiful and promising dancers, both in classical and modern styles. But her Jewish faith would change all that. Francisca, aged 22, was performing at Warsaw's Melody Palace nightclub when the Nazis invaded Poland. Because she was Jewish, she became a prisoner of the infamous Warsaw Ghetto. She was one of 400,000 Jews who were imprisoned in the Polish capital city, so that the Germans could keep them together and watch them closely. The living conditions were terrible and it is believed that thousands died due to the unsanitary conditions and slow starvation. Many didn't realize the sinister intention of this captivity, that this was basically the holding pen for the first rounds of Jews to be sent to the Nazi work camps for elimination. Due to her lighter complexion, she and others managed to hide for a time in the Aryan quarter of the city. By 1941, the Jews that were imprisoned in the Warsaw Ghetto were searching for a way out of the desperate situation they were in. There were many theories going around as to the best way to escape, and many of them led the Jews to the Hotel Polski. It was believed that the hotel was also a way to freedom, that you could pay to have paperwork produced that would guarantee you passage into neutral parts of the world, such as South America. As it turns out, this whole thing was a trap. It is now widely believed to have been a plot by the Nazis to lure out Jews who had gone into hiding. There are some accounts that say this whole plot started out as a legitimate agreement with noble intentions, but was hijacked by the Nazis and used to capture Jews instead. Most did not find the freedom they were seeking, but instead were callously deceived no matter how much money they had or the status they held. Francisca Mann was not exempt from this either, as she too joined 1,700 of her fellow Jews on a passenger train that would lead them to their deaths. Francisca was 26 years old when she arrived at Auschwitz from Bergen-Belsen on a transport train with other Jews. Unusually, the group had travelled not in the normal sealed goods wagon, but in regular passenger carriages as this was not the usual transport for Jews. The reason being was the normal carriage was part of the ruse so as not to alarm the passengers of their intended fate. On October the 23rd, 1943, a train pulls into the station at Auschwitz-Birkenau, carrying hopeful souls that fully believe they are on their way to a new life. Though the train has stopped, no one really panics because they are told that this was the last stop before they cross the border into Switzerland, and from there they will go on to South America. Little did they know this would be the last trip for most of them on board. What happened next is based upon actual eyewitness accounts from some of the prisoners at Auschwitz, including survivor Jerzy Tabau, whose testimony was documented at the Nuremberg trials. According to Tabau, the passengers were unloaded from the trains and told they were being taken to the showers to be disinfected, before being allowed to cross the border. The women were then sent towards the showers, which were in fact gas chambers. It was at this point that they were ordered to undress, and some of the women began to fear the worst. As the group of SS men noticed that some of the women were hesitating to follow instructions, it is reported that the guards started to hit the women and force them to undress. Francisca took the opportunity to defuse the situation by using her dancing talent to distract the guards. First, she lifted her skirt, then she removed her blouse and leaned against a pole to remove her high heels. The SS soldiers standing across from her didn't know how to react. She seduced them by stripping down to nothing but her high-heeled shoes and enticed them to come closer to her. 
One officer took her up on that, and that is when all hell broke loose. Francesca is said to have then removed one of her high-heeled shoes and smashed it into the face of an SS officer named Schillinger. Once she hit him, she was able to grab the pistol from his waistband. Francesca then fires the gun twice at Schillinger, and then once more at his comrade SS officer Emmerich. Schillinger had been a butcher in civilian life and enlisted in the SS in 1939. He was in charge of the men's kitchen at Birkenau and was known and feared among the prisoners for his sadistic beatings. He also supervised the arrival of Jews in transports at the train platforms, organized their gassing and later destruction in the crematoria. The other women were inspired by her actions and began to attack the guards as well. So fiercely in fact that it is said that one guard had his nose ripped off and another had his scalp nearly torn from his head. The light cables were torn down and the SS men were overpowered. One of them was stabbed and all of them were robbed of their weapons. As the room was in complete darkness, wild shooting started between the guards near the exit door and the prisoners inside. The women were locked in the chamber and reinforcements were summoned. The camp commander, Rudolf Hurst, came with other SS men carrying machine guns and grenades. As this scene unfolded, more SS guards arrived to put an immediate stop to the uprising. The enraged and desperate women had no chance. The Nazis, of course, had the advantage of both numbers and weaponry. Many of the prisoners were killed by machine gun fire and grenades, and those who weren't were either put in the gas chambers or taken outside and executed. Though the women had put up a valiant resistance, the forces they faced were just too overwhelming. What was the fate of our beautiful, courageous dancer? There are conflicting accounts as to how she met her end. Some say she was shot with many of the other women upon the arrival of reinforcements, while others claim that she took her own life with the pistol that she used to kill one of her tormentors. No matter how Francesca met her fate, one thing is made clear. She was brave, determined and certainly unwilling to surrender without a fight. Though it is heartbreaking, the legacy she leaves behind is one of beauty, persistence and above all, courage in the face of hate and tyranny. Auschwitz survivor Rieslaw Kieler stated in his memoir, Anus Mundi, Five Years in Auschwitz. The incident passed from mouth and embellished in various ways grew into a legend. Without doubt, this heroic deed by a weak woman in the face of certain death gave moral support to every prisoner. We realized all at once that if we dared raise a hand against them, that hand might kill. They were mortal too. Well, my dear viewers, another mini historical feature, and I've been meaning to cover this story actually for the last couple of years but there just wasn't enough information for this story to turn it into a full-length uh, presentation so it's ideal for the for the mini format um, and, and I think in that way the message becomes even more powerful in, in the shorter format um, the 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 photos that I found are of Francesca Mann so they, they are they're not just fillers they actually are her but there's not a great deal known about her early life, and um, and we have to rely on the on the eyewitness accounts of what happened and the record here from from the Nazis, which states that one of their officers was killed by a French Jewish woman, which we know to be Francesca Mann. Yeah, th th this this story really touched my heart, as any story where someone stands up against greater numbers and against tyranny you know that really really affects me and um you know i'm not i'm not a jew i'm not catholic i'm not any denomination i'm just a human and i see this from a human standpoint uh, when i say i'm not catholic i was actually brought up catholic and 
and at the age of 14, uh, I decided not to go to church anymore. I was just sitting in there and I realized that many of the parishioners, although in society they were classed as good people, you know, and they greeted each other and did all the right things, I knew them not to be good people. So in my mind that building held people who were not spiritual and not good people. So I don't think you need to go to a church to be spiritual. And a lot of people who are fanatically religious are just fanatics, really. It's not just believing in God that makes you a spiritual and a good person. There's more to it than that. So that's why I stopped going to church. Uh, I became like a free spirit with an open mind. I mean, I'm not an academic. I don't have all the answers, and I don't pretend to. I just keep an open mind. I keep searching. For, for whatever truth I find comfortable with. And it's just about being good to people, being good to your fellow human. And when I see atrocities like this, it seems to me that evil has more power and influence than good in this world. And, you know, not all politicians are evil. They're greedy and corrupt, but they're not all evil. But evil people tend to get into politics to get into positions of power where they can affect uh, the mass of people. So we always have to be wary. Uh, could something like this happen again? I believe it could. Maybe they'll do it in a different way, with a manufactured virus or something like that. But uh, there are cold people at the top, and they do not have our interests at heart. Make no mistake. Make no mistake about that. Because if we stand by and do nothing then we are also being complicit in this evil. We are encouraging it by not stopping it, by not standing up to it. You know, it's such things like the, the Nazi era, it enabled evil people. You know, we, 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 we see that, the, the Nuremberg War uh, trials, we, we saw that the, the most evil people blossomed. Of course, it brought, you know, they loved this. They loved this being able, that it was, sanctioned by their government to commit these atrocities, these vile things. And, and I know, you know, it's, it's hard to stand up to this sort of authority, to this sort of brainwashing, because you, every human has that feeling, thank God it's not me that's being singled out, that's being tortured, that's being in, in, kept in misery. And you fear that if you stand up to them, it's going to happen to you. And that's what they work on. You know, when I was a kid, I, was, I, I saw the images of the German villagers who were forced to parade and witness the horrors of the concentration camps. And there's one image, I just couldn't find it, of, of these women looking horrified at the uh, human skin lampshades with the tattoos on them and stuff like that. And, and the smell, the, the, the covering their mouths and noses, horrified about what has went on next door to them. Many of these villagers were probably unaware of what was going on or they didn't want to know because prying and finding out and saying something about it might result in their death too. Uh, it was a lot different back then, but they were faced with it afterwards and I'm sure it left an indelible print on their mind. Of course, we can't blame the German people, you know, in every country all around the world, there are good people, bad people, and indifferent people. Some may have con condoned what went on, and others were totally horrified about what's going on. You can't blame a nation. It's the, the small amount of evil people in charge who caused these atrocities. And other evil people eagerly joined them. There was many offering their services up to be able to have the power to abuse and torture and rape and murder people. Horrible as it is. You know, they didn't have the, uh, the benefit of the internet back then to spread information and truth. And we see nowadays in recent times, uh, during the, for example, the Arab Spring riots where internet communication helped, uh, helped coordinate those riots and end that dictatorship and you see after that now governments really cracking down on on what sort of information is spread through the internet we have to wonder why 
And nowadays we see the exact opposite happening with censorship on media. Mainstream media giving their side of the story and not allowing anybody else to give theirs. Independent news reporters are, are being blocked on YouTube, their channels deleted. And with this sort of mature content policy now, uh, such videos about atrocities are not being seen because they're not being promoted. So I wonder whether the day will come where they decide that our young people's minds are too sensitive to know about the harsh realities of what went on in the past, the horrible things that evil people perpetrated upon mankind. I wonder if that will happen one day. It wouldn't surprise me. It seems to be going in that direction. You know, they don't want, they want everything to be sort of fluffy and funny and nice and forget about history, forget about all the horrible things that's been done and that's being done now. <laughs> Mark my words, it's going on in different parts of the world. Terrible things to innocent people. A quote from Elie Weasel. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. Anyway, I think I've rambled enough. Time to hear your comments, what your thoughts are on this. And um, thank you for watching, my dear friends, and uh, catch you next time. By the way, about the giveaways, I've, I've, I think I've decided what I'm going to do with the giveaways. If someone doesn't claim the prize, instead of doing a redraw, I think this is what I'm going to do. I think this is better. I'm going to roll that prize over to the next giveaway. So therefore, the next person will win two mugs instead of one. Or maybe we, instead of two mugs, a t-shirt. So we sort of roll over instead of going for the whole draw again and they don't claim and they don't claim. I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to roll it over to the next prize. You know, a bit like when someone doesn't claim the lotto and the, the, the money pile gets bigger. Something like that. Anyway, take care, my dear, my dear viewers. Until next time, bye-bye.